Okay, last week we began the larger section in Peter's letter that discussed the applications of salvation. The first application that Peter uh, writes about is holiness. And we saw that last week, uh, that we are to live holy lives, conduct our, our whole behavior uh, because of the positive motivation of our future grace, uh, which is our hope and our rest, which will come at Christ's second coming. Uh, and that we don't have that rest right now. Right now is the time for work. And then also our present grace that God has shown us that we are now children uh, within his household, children uh, of a holy father, and therefore we should live like uh, a holy father. So uh, that showed us a positive motivation for living a holy life, which was God's grace. This week we will continue and study uh, Peter's second reason why believers should live holy lives, uh, which is the fear of God. 1 Peter 1, 17 through 21. Now, this reason consists of a negative motivation to live holy lives, opposed to the positive of God's grace that we saw last week. Uh, this, in this reason, there's going to be three facets. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and read the whole passage first, and then we'll, we'll go into the details. Uh, the passage says, uh, if, you address God, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but as revealed in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Okay, so moving to our first facet, it's going to be verse 17, which is the fear of our Father's discipline. Uh, the text says, if, if, you're fa- if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Now in Greek, there's also an and. It's and if. And it connects the sentence with uh, the previous passage. And, and thus uh, showing a second related but different reason for conducting our lives in holiness. And if, as you notice... Peter is continuing the child metaphor, the child in the household metaphor that he started in verse 17, I'm sorry, in verse 14, where it says, as obedient children. And if you notice uh, the contrast between children, and now we're talking about a father, here it says, it describes God the Father as the Holy One who called you. That same word is actually the word here for addressed in Greek. To address it means to call upon for help uh, and to, to make a request to continual, uh, continually pray and thus because you have a continual need. Uh, the word here is, is slightly different, but it's the same root where God has called you. Here, it's if you are addressing as Father. Basically, the idea is if you are addressing God, if you are calling out to Him, if you are continually praying to God as your Father, uh, because every one of us as children, when we grew up in a household, if we needed something, uh, we needed to ask our parents. And specifically here, our father. Uh, everything you needed, clothes, food, tools, can I go out, can I borrow the keys? Uh, you, you had to ask your father. That's the idea here. Uh, it's the father that provides for the household. Uh, so here... It's just like, uh, just like that, uh, like children in a household, and it implies that we are dependent on the Father for survival, for our spiritual life, for our spiritual fi- survival. And when it says if, if you, uh, it's not uh, suggesting that the audience is not. It it's actually has the idea of if you are doing this, and I know you are. Uh, it's kind of like saying if you're breathing, uh, then you you have to laugh at this. It's since you are, since you are addressing as father, the one who impartially judges. 
And we know this because Peter has already said that they've been born again in 1.3. Uh, they are children of God, and thus they have a relationship with God, and are, it, they are in his household, in the family of God. It's interesting uh, because do we ever think about our Christian life in this aspect? Do we, do we view ourselves as being children and dependent on everything in our lives is dependent on, on God, uh, on our Father? And we think about spiritually, that's more obvious, but also physically. Everything that you have, your ability to think, to work, uh, that your house hasn't blown over, that, that's all in his care and his provision uh, as a father. And here, it's teaching us that this is a normal way of life for a Christian. A Christian's characterized by praying and requesting and, and having a dialogue with our Father. So, uh, so as a, a children, as children come to their Father for aid, it becomes a model for us to rely on God. He goes on to say that this Father is impartial. Uh, it's, thus, he's not showing favoritism to anyone. He doesn't like one child above the other, uh, and his judgments are fair, period. Uh, it's, it's just, no matter who is the subject. And as his children, we're not given special permission to disobey him. Uh, we can't, because he loves us, we can't manipulate that to get away with things. Uh, and we are judged and disciplined all the more because we are his children. Uh, we're not judged as in receiving his wrath, we are judged and thus receiving his discipline as a loving father disciplines his children. Here the word for judge is a verb, it's, it's present tense, meaning it's the one who impartially is judging, right now judging. And this is how God functions as a loving father. The text I want to read to you now that explains this in more detail is in Hebrews. Hebrews 12, uh, 7 through 11 says this, it is for discipline that you endure, or in, in experiencing difficult circumstances, uh, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you were without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you would be illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us, earthly fathers, for a short time, as seems best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, and he knows all things, so that we may share his holiness. Do you see holiness there in that context as well? Same thing as what we're learning about in Peter. Verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So as a side note, kids who have, who have parents who discipline, A, it's out of love. B, they know a little bit more about God's word and about life and what is best for you. And just like the writer of Hebrews is saying, it's not fun. No one likes to be disciplined. But if you receive it and accept it and learn from it, then you will have lives that, are, that yield peaceful fruit of righteousness. Meaning, you, you then know what to do right. Have you ever, uh, your parents told you to do one thing, and then you went and did the other thing and then either got caught or made someone hurt or cry or got disappointed or got embarrassed and then you were, ah, if I only listened. Uh, if you do what was right, you'll have that peacefulness. You, you'll uh, have that part of the blessings of God. Uh, and that's why God has given you parents to help you, to train you, to show you God's ways. Uh, because let's face it, most of the circumstances that you are in right now, you've never been in before. And you don't need to know everything. You're not expected to know how to act in everything. Uh, come to your parents. They, they want to teach you. They want to train you. They want to help you uh, and build that wisdom. Back to First Peter. 
It says that you know, since we're addressing, we're making requests to God as the one who partially judges according to each man's works, according to how, how we live, well, if that's true and we're going to be disciplined just like everyone else, well, then we should conduct our lives, conduct ourselves in fear. The word for conduct is to live or behave in a certain way. Uh, and the way that it's a, it's a command, it's to s- situate your life this way. It's not a, I have to do this today and again tomorrow and the next day. It is, this is a mind frame. This is, it's, it's just something you apply to all of your life. Uh, conduct it this way. And, and how? What's that certain way? It's in fear. And in Greek, it's em- emphatic. In fear is actually first in the sentence. So it's in fear, conduct your, your, your lives during your stay on earth. Now, it's not fear of wrath. It's not fear of eternal punishment. It's not fear of being separated from God. But it's a fear of offending and not pleasing the one we love. Uh, and thus, if we offend or displease the one we love, then we m- are subject to discipline. So to fear is to have such a great respect and reverence for our Heavenly Father that it colors everything that we do. We want to be well-pleasing. We want to um, be in good favor in in the one whom we love. Not that it gains us salvation, but because we love him. And and we want to be close to him. And when does this happen? It's during our earthly lives. When we represent the household of God as being part of his family to others. Notice it says, uh, uh, during the time of your stay on earth. The stay, uh, it refers to foreigners. We're foreigners here in this land during our short time. Which is uh, a theme that he picked up from verse 1 and verse 2. So, reverence and fear was a part of every Jewish, ch- uh, Jewish child, child's obligation to parents. It was normal culturally. And even among Gentiles, children were supposed to obey the parents. That was normal. It was expected. Uh, but here, Peter is, is working from the lesser to the greater. If we all as children are to fear our, our father's discipline, and we want to please him, we want to respect him, we want to honor him, especially his name, how much more should we respect and honor God as our Father, who's brought us into a better household, who loves us more, and who cares for us more, and who's wiser. It's an argument from the lesser to the greater. So this command uh, indicates that God is active in our lives and deals with us as a loving father would his child, uh, and yet without partiality, but equally and with wisdom. So there are consequences for sin and disobedience, but there's also blessings for obedience and righteousness. So the fear of the Lord is a characteristic of the healthy church. Usually when we think of fear, we think of the Old Testament. But fear is having honor uh, and reverence throughout. Let me show you just one passage, uh, but I refer to a couple. Acts 9.31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up, and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. You see how a fear of the Lord is a characteristic of a healthy church, of believers who are in a right relationship. It's knowing, uh, wow, I don't want to do anything that would break fellowship or, or offend my father or do anything that uh, ruins his name because I call myself a Christian. It's that kind of fear. And then there's a few other passages there. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Colossians 3, 22, and 1 Timothy 5, 20. Just a few other that talk about the Christian and their obligation to fear God. How that's right. That's part of our lives. So this is the first facet. And it's the fear that leads to holiness is the fear of the Father's discipline. The second is the fear of dishonoring our Father's generosity. The second is is the fear of dishonoring our Father's generosity, verses 18 through 19. Uh, Now, we have to remember that verses uh, 17 through the end of this passage is all one big sentence. Uh, So in Greek, these are all connected thoughts and ideas. But 
the, the sentences break off into different topics. And this is the second topic. Uh, so building off of the command uh, to conduct yourselves in the fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of lives inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of the, as of the lamb, unblemished, spotless, the blood of Christ. So in this verse, Peter explains why God would be offended when the lives of his children, his sons and his daughters, are not carried out in holiness. We have not been bought with gold or silver, but we were bought with a life. So let's look at the first parts. Silver and gold, these are recognized currency of great value, great worth. But they're subject to decay. They are perishable. They're bound to this physical earth. So they're really only valuable here in our physical lives. Uh, They do not help us after this life. So here it says that you were not redeemed with these things, with the most valuable things on earth. The idea for redeemed, the word for redeemed is used in the Greco-Roman culture for paying a price to set a slave free. Someone's a slave, they could be paid, their owner could be paid, and then they would be free uh, from their, their bonds of slavery. It literally means that you were ransomed to purchase someone's freedom by paying a ransom. And what were they slaves to? It says from their feudal way of life. And feudal there means empty, worthless, useless, because they were slaves to sin. So a, a, a world of mere appearance uh, that are, uh, that's erected against reality. It's futile. It's empty. And therefore, that kind of world, that kind of slavery to sin is deceptive. And it's pointless. And it's, it's senseless. At the end of life, when you look back, uh, or when you die and stand before the, the throne of God and look back at your life, what is it going to be used for? What was it used for? Was it useless? Was it senseless? Senseless, Or was it according to God's purposes? Was it used for holy conduct? So in, in contrast to our, our present conduct, you know, he uses this same word. Uh, he's saying, conduct yourselves in fear now. But we were in a futile way of life. These two words as well are the same root. This is a verb, and this is a noun, but it's the same word in Greek. Uh, It communicates our way of life, our our behavior. Uh, And we are to conduct our lives now differently because we're in a different family. We're in a different life. We've been born again. And thus, he's continuing that that metaphor of childhood in a new family. Because here he says, you were in a feudal way of life, inherited from your forefathers. That was your earthly family. Uh, And it implies that their lives were godless, away from God, and thus Gentiles, pagans. They were uh, worshiping lifeless gods, idols, and thus they had godless lifestyles. And that was the way they were brought up. Now, if they were redeemed, um, I'm sorry, if you were redeemed, or they, by silver or by gold, you could pay it back. And once you're free, you could work and and pay back that person. The point here in this text is that there's no amount of money uh, that could be spent that could redeem a person's soul from the bondage of sin. So conversely, conduct yourselves in fear during your stay on earth, knowing that you were redeemed with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So although it's not silver or gold, the most valuable thing that we think of, it's actually something far greater. It's precious blood. Uh, The precious means exceptional value. So even more worth uh, of the blood of Christ. The blood of God's chosen king. God's anointed, promised king. His blood. Now normally kings don't die for people. People die for kings. Uh, so here, even in God's economy, at God's 